uh, Adam Neiman, a guy in the um, UK, put these two little things together. The one on the left is all the water on the planet, okay, so 1.4 billion cubic kilometres of it, that's a lot of water, including seawater, ice, lakes, rivers, groundwater, clouds, etc. It's shown on the same scale as the Earth. Now, when you look at it up there, there's not a lot of water, okay, well, there's definitely a limited amount of it. The one on the right is all the air, okay, all the atmosphere as if it was at ground level, okay, as a ball. Okay, so again, it's big and we're sitting in here, but you can see there's not that much of it. There is a finite limit to it, okay? Climate change, one thing that people think about when they say two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, is you almost have this sense that, okay, it was 32, that means it's gonna to go to 34, or it was 19 degrees, it's gonna to go to 22. That's not too bad. What they're talking about is an average temperature change. Okay, so when you start to look at why some of the impacts and the questions before about ice sheets melting, etc., you have a look at that, that's projections for what a four degree change means on average. Okay, lies, damn lies and statistics. So the average thing is I've got my head in the oven and my, my feet in the fridge and on average I'm comfortable. Okay, but I'm in trouble. So if you look up there, what you'll see is that the changes of four degrees average is actually a 16 degree increase in the Arctic regions, six to seven degree increase in the US Corn Belt and about six degrees in the Himalayas and in Australia. So if everything else is going up by six, where are the less than fours to get it to average? Well, it happens to be over the oceans. Okay, well, there's not a lot of us living in the ocean, so a, four de a two degree average temperature is more on land, less on the water, so the impact starts to scale out a bit. Okay, so just, just a couple of things on that. All right, we've heard methane emissions in parts per billion and um, carbon dioxide in parts per million. Okay, and it's pretty hard to get a sense around that. So pre-industrial revolution was 280, we're now at 380 to 400, and we look like we're going to 550 or beyond. Okay, what is a part per million? So you say, okay, we've gone from 280 to 380. Well, if there's 280 parts per million carbon dioxide, that means there's 999,800 um, or 720 that aren't. So we're really not changing it a lot. Remember the size of the atmosphere. One part per million of carbon dioxide is 7.8 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Okay, so every one part per million increase in carbon dioxide is an extra 7.8 billion tonnes into the atmosphere. Now there's some equations there, carbon, a carbon dioxide molecule is one carbon and two oxygens. So when you bring it back to the weight of carbon, it's actually 2.13 billion tonnes of carbon. Okay, so every time CO2 concentration increases by one part per, per million, we put another 2.1 billion tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere. Okay, now 2.13 billion tonnes of carbon is a block of graphite which is pure carbon, a kilometre long by a kilometre high by a kilometre wide. Okay, so every time we go up one part per million, there's a one cubic kilometre block of graphite pops up in the air. If that had been happening consistently and that's the way it was showing up, I think we'd be showing some more interest in it. Every time we went up one part per million, something that big chopped up in the air. Okay, so that's to give us some scale on the numbers. Okay. In order to have some way to deal with this, we need two things. We need capacity, we need something that can deal with a lot of carbon. Okay, there's not much point doing a tonne here and a tonne there. We need some serious numbers. And we also need something that has global application from a political point of view. Okay? So this is, you might have seen this graph before, it's one of lower research station and they're tracking the movement in carbon dioxide. And there's two fascinating things in that graph. The first thing which is very depressing is the general trend. Okay, the general trend of carbon dioxide is increasing, bottom left to top right. Okay, so that's we're going through here. The fascinating thing about it is what's it doing every year? It's doing this little up and down. Okay? So it's not just steadily getting worse. Every year on a cycle it's going up and then dropping and going up and then dropping. Okay? What's causing that cycle? You have a look down in the bottom right hand corner and remembering, swap it around northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, what that is is basically the regrowth of the boreal forests, of the, the um, deciduous forests in the northern hemisphere. So as they regrow in spring and summer, they suck up carbon dioxide. As the leaves drop in winter, they drop the carbon dioxide and release it again. Okay, so there's your annual cycle. The interesting thing is, let's have a look at how much it is on an annual move. Okay, and that graph, that concentration is moving about 6%, 6, to, six parts per million. 
Okay, and if it's moving six parts per million, and every part per million 7.8 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, or two billion tonnes of carbon, what it means is that the trees in the Northern Hemisphere growing leaves and then dropping leaves every year are removing from and releasing to the atmosphere 13 billion tonnes of carbon. Okay, so the photosynthetic process in nature has an incredible capacity. Okay, so 13 billion tonnes of carbon. Just think of how many truckloads of something that is. That's a lot of material that's just simply coming in and out as trees grow leaves and drop leaves. Okay. If you look at that capacity and then look at it in, in global terms and say, so, okay, there's 13 billion tonnes of carbon going in and out and it's coming in and out where? Well, it's only northern hemisphere trees, so forget the bottom half. We're not talking rainforest because they're not deciduous, they're not dropping leaves, and they're just basically stability. We're not talking all this grassland, we're not talking a lot of the, um, the fir forests and the spruce forests which are evergreens. We're talking the country in the top here and across Europe. Okay, so there's not a lot of that country that's actually having that massive impact. You then start to have a look at the rest of the, nation, the world and you say, okay, well, we've got basically the coal bit at the top and the bottom. We've got the tropics through the middle with the rainforests. Okay, and then here we've got a huge chunk of grazing land. Grazing land, grazing land. All through here is grazing land, across the top and there. Okay, so what you've got is a massive amount proportionately. There's a lot of interest in preserving rainforests. Okay, there's about 1.6 billion hectares of rainforest left on the planet. The thing about rainforests is if they've been there for a thousand years, their carbon is in balance. Okay, they're not getting bigger and smaller, they're about in balance. So preventing destruction of rainforest is critical because it's stopping releasing it. But we're not going to grow back more rainforest. That's pretty that's not going to happen. There's some forest issues, okay, and there's certain areas in the world that can grow timber and certain areas that can't. But there's five billion hectares of grassland on the planet. The interesting thing from a political point of view is if you look at Africa, these countries in the middle have got the rainforest. If you look at Brazil, it's got the rainforest. But more than half of Brazil is grassland. Okay? And there are far more countries in Africa that don't have rainforest than that do have rainforest. I was at a conference and there was a delegate from Senegal, and Senegal sits in over here. And what they said, quite simply, was we haven't got coal-fired power stations, okay? and we haven't got industrial developments, and we haven't got rainforest. The only thing we've got is grazing land. Unless some sort of grazing gets brought into the climate change side, there's no way for us to participate. Okay? There were some comments before that Australia, it doesn't matter what we do. Okay? In, a, in a physical sense, no, but in a policy sense and in a showing the way sense, look where the grasslands are on the planet. You've got Argentina and Brazil, not particularly stable eco economies. You've got Southern Africa. Okay, well, I don't know any, many people who would be willing to invest long-term in development projects in Southern Africa. Um, you've got the US. Even in the US, you've got your, your um, Indian Lands Bureau, your Federal Lands Bureau, your, your Forestry Services. You've then got all this country through here. Which country on the planet has got a lot of grassland and a stable economy and a stable political thing and consistency of legal, legal structure and legal tenure? Okay. That's the opportunity that Australia agriculture has, and specifically Australian grazing land. Okay, really simple stuff. Um, a tree, okay? People with trees, they go, okay, it's carbon, and everyone has carbon sink forests. And one of the things that I've, had, I've done a couple of times is, is at a meeting in Copenhagen, which was a business leaders summit, and they were talking about what they wanted. It was input into the big meeting in Copenhagen coming in December. And there was a big push for the inclusion of forest carbon, forest carbon, forest carbon. And it was a case of getting them to broaden that definition to terrestrial carbon, which includes soil carbon. Okay, now people see trees and they go, okay, they work, they sequester carbon. You think about the biggest tree you've ever seen. It's big, it's solid, it's heavy, you can hit it with a bulldozer. Okay, and it weighs a couple of hundred tonnes and it started with its tiny little seed. Okay, and it's made of stuff. It's got a couple of hundred tonnes of stuff in it. Where did the stuff come from in the tree? 